welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Jillian Riegert. She is an oral medicine specialist and radiation oncology research fellow. She wrote the Kevin MD article, Eating Disorders Thrive in Secrecy. So let's talk about it, starting with BMI. Jillian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll share the journey that is relevant to the articles that I've submitted so far for the Kevin MD uh, readers. So I have a background. I started uh, in undergrad in Illinois, really interested in going into psychology. And I love mental health. And at the time, it wasn't favored by uh, my parents. So I tried to do a backdoor way into psychology. And I ended up in dentistry. And the correlate is that I thought, what better way to serve a person and to make them feel most confident by giving them that confident smile and really impact the way that they see themselves through their identity, uh, which is usually the face. So I ended up going into dentistry. I did not like dental school. I knew quite quickly it probably wasn't the best fit for me. And at the time, my dental school was associated with an Air Force base. And there were Air Force oral surgeons that came uh, and rotated through our clinics. And I said, that's what I want to do. You know, I saw them. I really liked how they composed themselves and I loved the medicine part of my dentistry training. So I set my sights on being an Air Force oral surgeon. That's how I got through dental school. I was lucky or grateful to have been selected for a six year oral surgery uh, program. It was through the Air Force and I commissioned into the Air Force right after dental school. And when I got into the Air Force, here I had, you know, the career trajectory I thought was the right fit for me. And I quickly was having my head up, realizing it was not the right fit for me. And in facing that reality, I developed quite severe depression, which is in one of the articles I mentioned about that part of my journey, as it was titled high functioning depression. And talk a little bit about why that's kind of a misnomer. And my coping skill for that depression started being some eating disorder behaviors, mm. uh, which is anorexia, which I had had issues with when I was an adolescent. And at that time, my weight was normal. So I wasn't really triggered to get help. It did really affect me emotionally. I made my work a lot harder. And, and I met with the Air Force Oral Surgery Board. And I said, you know, I'm not sure I should continue. I had severe depression, noticing uh, my eating disorder behaviors ramping up. And they said, maybe it's just your self-confidence. You know, we had that whole rival fallacy, like, I'm just hoping it's going to get better when. Mm. So I, I was matched into a civilian... Uh, six-year program since the Air Force only had four-year programs at that time and I really wanted to do medical school. So I held on to the belief that maybe things will get better in my civilian program. I went to a great program only to learn that surgery was not the best fit for me and really didn't know what to do at that point because I felt committed not only to the Air Force, I had signed a 13-year contract, but to this program that I loved in terms of the people, just not the career trajectory. And the depression got worse. Uh, I was facing uh, a lot of suicidality in my thought process. And it was like my mind was hijacked. And this was 2014. And I didn't feel that people were really talking about it. I thought I was the only one. And my coping skill then just became a deeper rut into anorexia. And I still couldn't quit. And so it took me three years to get to a point where I was being medically discharged from the military, hospitalized for anorexia in a really grief state with depression to finally say, all right, I surrender, you know, this isn't going to go well if I don't uh, make a huge career pivot. And so that brings me to kind of where I went today when I, I left the Air Force. This is a, this is a lesson I don't, I do not recommend for others. I left the Air Force and was retired in October 29th, 2017. I started my next residency the next day. Mm. Because I couldn't sit with the grief of losing all the identities I had. And I had lost an ex-boyfriend. It was just too much. And so to cope with burnout and all that, I jumped into a new residency, which I laugh at now. It just wasn't the best idea. But it was, I live alone. I depend on myself. Um, and I thought I had to do that. So I was very fortunate to go to an oral medicine program. That was a really good fit for me personally. I had really great mentors there that helped to cater me through. Graduated from that residency. 
Last year I wasn't attending and it wasn't a good fit for me. And, you know, with COVID happening, a lot of that stress turned for me, it just highlighted I was not immune to anorexia, really taking control again. So I got into another grave state last year and almost lost my life to anorexia through medical complications related with, you know, it can wipe up your immune system and your heart rate. Mine was quite low. And at that point I look up and I said, is this all my life is ever going to be? And I had decisions to make and I was feeling so exhausted from it all. I was so fortunate to find a podcast by, there's an anesthesiologist at Wake Forest and he speaks his truth and he is into coaching now. And then I found more people that are into coaching and we hear it for burnout and people think, oh, you know, is it really that great? Yes, it saved my life. And the intervention is I met some physicians that were feeling burnout and spoke their truth so I could relate and I felt heard and Mm -hmm. I felt seen despite not knowing them. And I just was so sick of being sick, but I said, I'm just, I'm finally ready to just take a risk on change. And I, I started to really dive into new opportunities which brings me forward to my current role, which is something I never would have imagined. I'm, I've taken a break from clinic. I'm a full-time research fellow in radiation oncology and m- picked up my bag, sold everything I own to move across the country for this new opportunity. It really felt like that reset I needed. So there's a lot to unpack there in your journey. So many obstacles that you've overcome. So the one question I want to ask you is that, can you go into more detail about some of the things that, that you did specifically to overcome some of these obstacles that you talked about, whether it's burnout, whether it's the eating disorder, whether it's a suicidality, what, what, what's the, the one or two things that, that you felt you did that made the most difference in your life? Honestly, I think it's being surrounded by the people that could fight for me when I didn't have the ability to fight for myself. I was surrounded by a very supportive community that believes in me and that sees value in my life when I cannot. And you mentioned a little bit of coaching and similar minded clinicians. Was that the community that you're talking about that turned things around for you? Yeah, and it's in and communities along the way. When I was an oral surgery resident, I had a program director that saw me as a human first. Without him, I wouldn't be here, clearly, because he didn't make me feel guilty. I was feeling guilty. I still to this day feel guilty about leaving that residency. And he never made me feel that way. He, he champions for me. And I had just a conversation, a text message with him recently. He's always championing to see me succeed. And so it took that and, and I won't downplay the years of therapy I've had along the way when I was a surgical resident, uh, I was given the ability to see a counselor every Monday or a psychologist every Monday. And that psychologist was a gift to me. He specialized in eating disorders and his, he has a humor to him, but he's very serious at the same time. And he really helped shape some of my thoughts. Uh, When I was severely depressed, I had the thought that I needed to finish my residency or take my own life. And those thoughts were concrete. I was so rigid. I didn't see another opportunity, another option. And the psychologist would say, or what? And I'm like, or what, you know, I don't, I cannot, I cannot be disgraced by quitting, by leaving. And what would that mean for the rest of my career? And then at at a point it became my career, my life, which I know we can talk about in another opportunity we have together, but that was the reality I faced was like, if I don't make a decision now, and I don't want people to get to that point where it's like, this is my life. And at that, I wasn't, it wasn't a clear decision to me because I was so exhausted and depressed. I was like, well, you know. And I, you can read between the lines there. It was like, you know, I don't know if I have that fight in me. So I really relied on other people helping to fight for me and just being that conduit of support until I had the energy to stand on my own two feet. All right. Let's transition to the Kevin MD article that you wrote. It's titled eating disorders thrive in secrecy. So let's talk about it, starting with BMI. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Yeah, absolutely. So this came off of an article written by Kara Pepper, uh, Dr. Kara Pepper, an internal medicine um, physician who wrote about the issues with BMI as a measurement of health and how it's not and how it's biased, discriminatory and flawed. And being it hit me at the perfect time because here I am sick of being sick. I'm you know sick of being misunderstood. 
And not only me, but I see how my silence is impacting the ability for others that are silenced by eating disorders to get care. And now into my journey, I'm at a point where I can speak openly about my eating disorder. And I think I can find value in the pain where, where being silenced was not providing any value at all. And I have a drive to fight because I see how our medical system and society really does a disservice to people, especially with body image, weight, eating disorders aside. Like these people, in terms of people that are actually diagnosed with eating disorders, I think that our weight-based society, diet culture really does a disservice to most people mentally, physically, it's like, you know, um, just holistically in a way that's not correlated with health. So why do we keep doing it? And how that looked in my life was early on, I used the BMI as a measurement of if I was worth getting help for anorexia, because uh, this was 20 years ago. It was clearly defined in the diagnostic criteria. I knew I had an issue in my head, but my weight was higher on this BMI scale. Mm -hmm. And so it was very much celebrated that I was trying to lose weight, even though it was right after puberty when I should have been just appreciating my body was turning into a woman. And I just going back to that time and that pain that I felt, I don't want other people to feel that pain because here I am higher end of the BMI scale with a very restrictive eating disorder, which is isolating, which is part of where the title came up. Everything is thriving in secrecy, takes over in secrecy. So this BMI number that was diagnostic of criteria not only became defining for myself, but was an obstacle in insurance endeavors. So it took a very long time for me to get help. And I think, you know, it's shown now that if people can get help and turn the corner quickly, they have a really good chance at uh, a stronger recovery from eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm here 20 years later, almost losing my life to it again. And I'm wondering like how much of earlier intervention would have spared me the suffering would have spared others the suffering. And I think it needs to be brought to a discussion. So in your ideal scenario, what would you have changed about the medical establishment to address your situation better? I think that for one thing, the eating disorders are such a psychological suffering and it has more to do with identifying them as a mental health condition mm -hmm. than a weight-based anything, just taking weight out of the criteria for that and accepting that, you know, people have hired, there's a weight stigma and I've just listened to conversation with somebody that would be um, considered, you know, obese and, and she has a restrictive eating disorder that may be championed for the rest of her life. And that's horrible. If people knew the torment and live one day with a restrictive eating disorder, they'd understand the torment, but it's so misunderstood and hard to explain to people that don't have an eating disorder. That actually was one component about what kept me silent for so long. Cause I would try to express myself and tell people what I was thinking. And it's so irrational that they're like, that's crazy. And just go eat something. And I'm like, that's not it. So I think the more voices that we can get and explain what role their eating disorder has in their life, we can better understand the complexities of eating disorders. Is there a story or a case study that you could share with my audience that can kind of illustrate some of these misconceptions that you're talking about eating disorders? I think if you read into like the health at every size and just hear testimonials from the people that are affected, the conversation that I had just heard was online. And I knew there was a documentary called Fatitude, which was a lot about weight-based stigma. And that's one documentary I'd recommend. We're talking to Jillian Riegert. She is an oral medicine specialist and radiation oncology research fellow. She wrote the Kevin MD article, Eating Disorders Thrive in Secrecy. So let's talk about it, starting with BMI. Jillian, for those other clinicians or um, students going through a medical or dental journey who are also struggling with an eating disorder, what kind of advice can you share with them through your own experiences? Well, I think uh, one thing that's very common with all people with eating disorders is kind of a lower self-worth and lack of self-compassion. So that's really where I'd start is taking a step back and leaning into that and, and really developing that inner self-worth and self-value because you're valuable, you're worthy. And so whatever the system's doing to take that away from you, we have to fight back. 
you mentioned that the medical establishment in general has work to do when it comes to addressing eating disorders. Any other resources or recommendations that you can advise? You know, I think community is one thing. I do think there's strong value in the people that have dedicated their lives to evidence-based research support. So I lean on them. I've had some really great providers in North Carolina, but that's been a small subset. So one mm-hmm. thing I would say is that there are times where people go to a higher level of care and they wonder, why am I not better? Why is my child not better? From my personal experience, sometimes those types of facilities may actually exacerbate an eating disorder and not all facilities should be treated equally with their ability to help someone recover. And so I think us finding the people that are doing a great service that are dedicated, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I have had those people in my life that have been part of the people that have kept me alive. And then when it comes to outside of the medical establishment, it is really that finding the people that see your value, that can help you see your value and surrounding yourself with them. And from a primary care standpoint, I'm a primary care physician. We have a lot of other primary care clinicians listening to this podcast. What kind of advice can you share with them to help address these treatment gaps when it comes to eating disorders? Yeah, it's all about how we talk to patients about weight. Eating disorders, again, are mental health conditions, but we are creating a situation where people are feeling ashamed of their body and we are overemphasizing weight as a parameter for their medical health in a way that if I were to have an eating disorder where I would eat for comfort, that might actually increase the chances that you're stimulating someone to gain weight. And so I think being mindful of the why, and I think the one thing we need to do better is listen. And my final question, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Just, I think that as providers, you know, I know it's really hard for us to take care of ourselves and that stimulates the challenges that we face when we take care of patients. So as we promote and prescribe self-compassion for our patients, uh, make sure we're prescribing that for ourselves so that we can also pay it forward rather than try to fill their cup when ours is empty. Jillian, thank you so much for sharing your story time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kevin. Appreciate it.